session on podcast form. I'm really happy that so many people are here, actually. And so what we're going to do is we've got a number of panelists, and I'm going to have them each say about three to five minutes about what their show is and what the form is. And then we're going to have kind of a more free form discussion about form and why we chose the forms that we did and things like that. So um, we are just going to jump right in and I'm just going to go in the order that's in the program, y'all. So um, just be prepared for when, <laughs> when I call your name. And Myra's not here, so that means Robin, you are up first. And you're muted, Robin. Thanks for the introduction and 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 thanks for the for the event in general. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to join all of you. Um, I'm not sure where all of you are, but I'm coming from Wasanich territory, um, the Sekum Sartlip, uh, Sayout Pakrachin, and Malahat folks uh, who've been in my neighborhood forever and ever and ever. I uh, feel really fortunate to be able to to be in this place. Um, so I'm going to speak just really briefly about uh, a project of mine. Uh, Conversations in the Arts and Humanities is a podcast which began in the fall of 2019 as a sort of long-form promotion for our Faculty of Arts and Humanities uh, colloquium. Uh, the colloquium, which is a monthly public lecture series, had been running for 10 years and radio advertisements were part of our promotional materials. Vengeance or Justice, Crime and Punishment in Oedipus Rex and Contemporary Canadian Corrections. The VIU Faculty of Arts and Humanities invites you to its free colloquium series. This Friday, October 25th at 10 a.m. in the Malaspina Theatre, Eliza Gardner from the Theatre Department will talk about directing Sophocles' play and show how 5th century tragedy relates to modern criminal behaviour. For more info, visit ah.viu.ca and click on Colloquium Series. So these ads were voiced by Theo Finnegan uh, from English. Uh, and the music is by trumpeter Greg Bush from Music. These ads were fun, but we wanted to create more substantial content for the radio that would not just advertise the colloquium was happening, but also provide longer lasting audio portraits of faculty and their activities. So we decided to produce the shows not as traditional interviews, but instead as unrehearsed chats, Theo and a guest, uh, loosely focused by an upcoming presentation topic. Uh, and yesterday, Merle Eisenberg and others discussed the chat cast format. Um, as such conversations, the podcast became a relaxed and tangential oral companion to the lecture series. The shows often consider student engagement and teaching strategies, and they recount the career paths of our faculty, allowing them to share their interests and hobbies outside of school. Uh, here's a short example featuring Amelia Horsberg. One of my favorite parts about teaching here is that it's such a small community that you can go to Superstore, you can um, go on a hike or a trail or go to Starbucks, and I am guaranteed to hear running from, or not running, I don't think they run up to me, but they do, I do hear from across the grocery store, hey, Professor Horsberg, and I'll be like, oh my goodness, there's another student, and I can introduce them to my family if we're shopping together, or if I'm at Starbucks, they'll, you if conversation simply aired on the radio, it wouldn't be a podcast. Now, aside from its URL, Conversations doesn't deliberately refer to itself as a podcast. There's no mention of podcast in the website content, and we don't use the term as any kind of reminder for the listeners. However, the episodes of Conversations are collected online, gently augmented with associated materials, and available asynchronously for binge listening. Uh, a big part of why I'm here today is the relationship between our campus community radio station, CHOY, uh, and our university. Um, and so that kind of station has the responsibility and requirement to prioritize voices of the community. And I've found that students in particular are excited to engage in the radio format for publishing as an alternative to text and print. Each episode of Conversations is initially broadcast on CHOY a few days before its presentation uh, and then makes its way online to become part of the bigger anthology. Uh, Eric Newsom mentions this in his podcasting guide, Make Noise. I think we should do a show together that can live on the radio and as a podcast and sound like it belongs in both places. So here's the episode template, exactly 25 minutes to fit with the radio clock. The raw conversations are usually 25 to 30 minutes and are placed in this top track here. Uh, as editor, I trim only as necessary. Uh, a listener tuning into the broadcast may think that the show is happening live. Uh, for regular listeners, any additional production elements like, like theme music that's over here and over here 
uh, background music that moves around as necessary, uh, any field recordings that seem appropriate, station IDs somewhere in the middle of the show. You can see I've got a selection of station IDs uh, that I can choose from. Uh, spoken intro and outro and any other oralizations uh, become part of the familiar structure. And that's that. Fantastic. All right, Jared. Where's Jared? I lost you on the screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been very much enjoying the symposium so far, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about the different approaches to form that, uh, that we all have. I'm going to see if I can uh, efficiently share my screen to play uh, a brief segment of the podcast that I produce in collaboration with Professors Amra Brooks and Scott Cohen at Stonehill College. Um, our podcast is called the Electro Library. It is, I suppose, best described, well, we call it a uh, uh, cabinet of curiosities for your ears. It's really an anthology show that's built around a theme for each episode. Uh, and that theme is intended to move um, across time. So we may have readings from uh, ancient texts, but also across cultural experience, we try to incorporate as much diversity of voice, that is, voice of those who have written the original texts, uh, as well as voice of the voices of those who read. So our show actually does not have a host. Uh, we alternate doing the introduction to the theme, and, uh, and I'll talk about this a little later when we're discussing form, but then the show just moves through the different voices. Uh, some of them are live readings, some of them might be brief interviews, uh, and others might be archival sound. And um, there's really never a moment that a host returns to comment or frame as, as we move through the material. Uh, hopefully this will um, share the sound easily enough. This is from, we've been on a little bit of a hiatus because of uh, the pandemic, but uh, I did manage to produce an episode called Quarantine, um, and I just thought I would play a little bit so you can hear uh, what it sounds like. Um, right. Quarantine by D.A. Powell. Sounds like a miner's melody or a gemstone set in platinum. A set of blonde and imbricated petals. The perplexing swish of botany's haste. A season originates, then gratifies and ends. Sounds like so many things that happen as beyond, now entering. Solve all arboreal problems that you can. Then what to do when box elder bugs aren't rampant? That's a different set of worries. Play worry in different keys. C is where you always start and end, or so my teacher said for he was taken by the logic of the dominating swarm, the way it left the punctured globes upon the boughs. We played a spray of ditties in his wake. They sounded like most pickers, those in tempo, those articulating their misfortunes. Or at least, that's what I imagined going on. Black dots spread, black spots. Pretty soon, the world is one great gall. Then what? Then we hide in the meadow. Oh, how it hums, this meadow. All right, so I'll just stop there for a moment. I hope uh, you were able to hear it. That's just an example of what would have come directly after the introduction. The introduction has a kind of uh, generic introduction. Uh, and then that's followed by um, the the initial segments that that we play, uh, and that's basically the um, the way that the show goes. So uh, I know we'll be talking a little bit more about the decisions uh, surrounding the form that we've chosen, but I think um, generally speaking, that would give you a sense of what we're trying to do. Um, and always one thing I will mention also is that while it is a literary art show. And so most of our material does come from philosophy, from literature, poetry, fiction, uh, creative nonfiction. Uh, we also try to always bring in the voice of another discipline to see what so-called storytelling might be like from another perspective. So for instance, in our very first episode, 
we are in our fourth year, if, if we take away the, the hiatus time. Um, so back in 2017, our first episode was appropriately storytelling. That seemed like the right way to begin this kind of uh, experiment. Uh, we invited somebody from mathematics to speak to us about the infinite monkeys theorem and to essentially tell us a math story that related to the idea of storytelling and um, literary production and uh, cultural transmission and so on. And we've had neuroscientists and we've had graphic artists and photographers. So just trying to bring in voice that seems to offer a different way of perceiving and of articulating the central theme. Great. All right. Next up, we have Patrick. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to the session, and, and I'm very happy to be included here. Um, I'm co-host of a podcast called Even More Mashed Up with a colleague of mine. Uh, he's a professor in history, Dr. Alan Austin. And I'm a professor of English, both of us at Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania. Uh, we build the show as two professors talking about all things pop culture, and so it's a very uh, conversational, or, or as I've learned at, at this symposium, a, a uh, chat cast uh, format um, that allows us to, to talk about pretty much uh, whatever we're interested in or whatever is, is going on in pop culture at the time. Uh, Alan and my research interests are both on... Um, both on race and on uh, superhero uh, comics and comics more generally. So we do a lot of episodes on um, the various film versions of superhero characters. We talk a lot about the MCU, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and the, uh, to a lesser extent, the DC Extended Universe, uh, as well as all of the, the TV shows and things like hey, that. Probably, I was going to put... So. Carry on. Okay, wasn't sure if that was a question. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we do a lot of episodes on on uh, superheroes, uh, sort of, of pop culture. Wait. Um, and then we've also do a number of different uh, other other elements of pop culture. Al and I are both big musical fans, so we've done shows on Hamilton. We've done uh, did a show on La La Land when it came out. Our actually our next episode that will be dropping hopefully this coming week is on the film version of Dear Evan Hansen. Um, and then we also talk about fairly random things. Uh, we've got episodes on Tiger King, Fault in Our Stars, Riverdale, Glow, Frozen. Um, and then, you know, we've got regular bits that we do that are the, um, such as the Toy Hall of Fame. We do a show every year on the nominees and selectees for the Toy Hall of Fame, which allows us to indulge our nostalgia um, for the, the toys when we were kids. So it, it, it's fairly broad ranging, very conversational, uh, very lightly produced. It's me, Alan, and another, uh, our, our producer, Rich, um, who is, is no longer with the university. And so we're, we're all doing this on our, our own time. So each episode is roughly about an hour and it's pretty much uh, unedited, uncut from what we actually did in the studio. There, there's very little uh, editing or anything like that. So that, that's sort of uh, the podcast in a nutshell, I would say. Great. All right, Hannah. Yes. Uh, well, thanks so much uh, for having me, and I'm very glad to be here. Uh, my name is Hannah. I am. I've just started my PhD on uh, conspiracy narratives in American fictional podcasts, and I'm also the co-host and founder of the Voices of the Humanities podcast. So my introduction will be. Uh, sort of in two parts, because I first want to talk a little bit about a fictional podcast as a kind of. Um, that's something that most of you aren't talking about, but I thought it would be interesting to bring it, in, bring it up. And secondly, a little bit about my own podcast. So um, for my research, I really look into the fictional podcast. And one of the questions that I grapple with is um, how do we tell stories in sound and especially fictional stories? Because I would argue that especially fictional podcasts are really able to exploit all the affordances that the podcast has. So um, I would say like in what kind of forms do they come? Um, I would say that most of the fictional podcasts kind of come in forms where um, it's always kind of answering the question, where does the footage come from? So it's sometimes or quite often has this sort of found footage kind of uh, structure. 
So, for example, um, this is idea of tapes that have been rediscovered and that are now being voiced publicly. Uh, one of example is a Dutch English language podcast called the Deca Tapes or um, Alice Isn't Dead, where you find these tapes and there that's where sort of the, the sound comes from. Um, you and these recordings are also often quite intimate, so it's almost like you're listening in to something that you shouldn't have been listening to. Um, some also take the form of the radio show. I think one of the most famous ones is Welcome to Night Vale, because uh, it pertains to be some kind of radio show, but then it's actually a fictional podcast. And it also subverts kind of all the like actual conventions of the radio show, because it does have the segments, but the weather, for example, is always a musical segment. Um, and then you also see quite a few fictional podcasts that use kind of the serial model of, you know, the single journalist investigator that takes on a case or investigates a mystery and kind of reports on their findings. And one of the things that I, as I already mentioned, I found very interesting about fictional podcasts is that uh, they really use all these different things that you can do with sound. So, for example, one uh, podcast I'm investigating, investigating right now for my PhD is called Rabbits. And it really makes use of the sort of complete surround sound that the uh, headphones afford. So uh, there's one scene in a boxing sort of environment. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Milan. <laughs> and so you have you hear like boxing in the background of this head and the voice and like the voice of the one person is in, in the left sort of headphone and uh, the other person's on the right. So it kind of plays with that. I think Welcome to Night but also makes use of these affordances quite well. Uh, there's one episode called All Right. And um, it's it's full of like starts with the disclaimer that this podcast is best to be listened uh, to via headphones, and then you only hear sound from the right kind of like from the right part of your headset. And I thought, huh, is what's wrong? Is my headset broken? But no, the narrator actually says that it addresses this. Like, no, you need your left ear to keep an ear out for the rest of the world because something's coming for you. So it really plays with this idea, um, and it also switches around a couple times. And at some point, it says. Uh, maybe put your finger in your left ear because you, you have to listen to this. And then later the narrator says, um, wait, did you just put your finger in your ear? Uh, everybody saw you do that. Like, uh, what's happening? Kind of. So it really also messes with this idea. Um, so I guess that's what I find so interesting about fictional podcasts, that they really think about how to tell these stories. Um, and a little bit about my own podcast, uh, I started The Voice of the Humanities because I felt, especially, well, in the Netherlands specifically, uh, it's quite hard to get funding for humanities projects. So I'm very glad that I got my PhD position. But so we really felt that the humanities really has so much to offer. So we want to kind of broadcast humanities research in our podcast. And in our podcast, what we try to do, um, we have this very conversational podcast. So it's kind of like we start a conversation, we kind of see where we end up. Uh, but the, our main goal is to sort of let the research speak for itself. So we, our, our main format is that we interview scholars that we find, like whose work we find interesting, uh, preferably not just from our own field, but also from other fields. And just through the conversation, try to get to this point, like why, why is this so important and why should everybody listen to and pay for <laughs> humanities research? Um, but happy to elaborate on either of those things uh, later. Great, thank you, Hannah. All right, a man that did Lee, Lee is not here, right? Okay, so Amanda. Yes, hello, um, I'm, I'm Amanda Raswell. I'm from the University of Copenhagen where I am now a PhD fellow in French, but it's not really going to be about that because before I became a PhD fellow, I was a research assistant at a project called Lockdown Reading. And I'll just say a bit of about the project at first, so you know what it's about and why we chose to make a podcast about it. So the project is really about why people read during uh, COVID and why uh, and how they've uh, used literature in, in different ways during the pandemic. And it's a comparative uh, project um, between four, made by four researchers, and two of us are Danish and two are from the UK. So the 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 project is it's is itself bilingual um, and uh, and of course the researchers uh, some of us are as well. Um, and then because of the pandemic we couldn't make a conference as we had promised to do. So instead we chose to make a podcast and I uh, was the one producing and hosting that. And um, so the, the podcast that we made for this project is very 
is not a running series. It's only five small or short episodes. Um, and they are on uh, 14 to 22 minutes each. And uh, we wanted to, to kind of use it to transmit what we did, um, what, what was this project about, but also how do you conduct research within the field of literary sociology, which is crossed with literary criticism, which is not very well known in Denmark. Um, and uh, I think more known in the UK, but but the, the podcast was for the Danish podcast market, if you could say that. So um, so it it was more like to, to transmit these discussions that we were having and also our methodology to a, a Danish audience. So to do that, we, we used um, a theme for every episode. So we have uh, different themes and one of them are is time, space, communities. Um, and every episode uh, contains three things. So firstly, it, it has um, snippets from interviews that we did with readers. Um, we use reader response theory as well. So we used the, the actual material in our research in the podcast. We were, of course, we of course checked uh, with the readers that we could do that. So, uh, and we were very fortunate to do so. Um, and then secondly, um, every podcast had an interview with a researcher on the given topic. Uh, topic. So um, I interviewed uh, some of my colleagues on the research project, but also other colleagues. We also um, interviewed, for example, an architect uh, on the space one. Uh, so to, to get who also conducted research in like COVID, um, how we use space during COVID. Um, so that was the third thing we had in the in every episode. And then lastly, we had extracts extracts from mentioned um, fiction. So um, snippets from uh, Albert Camus, The Plague in one episode, and maybe Emily Bronte's DNA in another. Um, so it's like mixed like that. And of course, we also had a bit, bit of speak, which I did in Danish. So because of this bilingual uh, uh, object or aspect of the research project, we also chose to make the podcast itself bilingual. So I speak on it in Danish, but some of my colleagues will, uh, I interview them in English. And, um, and it could be, I think for some locations, difficult to do so. But in Denmark, the audience who would listen to a podcast like this uh, are mostly very good at English. They're fluent in, in the English, English language. And those who are not maybe uh, that interested in, 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 the, uh, in the topic wouldn't, they, they, they wouldn't get there anyway. So, so we thought it might be okay. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, so it also makes it possible to do so because we have this group of very fluent speakers we we didn't have to translate we didn't have to dub anything and we didn't have to explain further uh, and I think that was what made that whole thing possible or that part of the form possible um, of course it also did something to the form it's it's less I think coherent maybe uh, than it would have been it was if if it was only in in one language but um, it also, yeah, it also, it also maybe adds to this understanding of what is like an international research environment. So it has pros and cons. Yes, I think that's pretty much what I have to say right now. And I'm really happy to discuss everything with you later. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, well, as the chair of this session, I am gonna make myself go last here, but I do, I, my show is a little bit different than everybody else's that's talked so far. So. I want to talk about it for just a little bit. Um, so a little bit about my background. I'm actually the head of um, a studio called R2 Studios at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. And the show that you can see on your screen right now is the show that I produce and host. It's called Constellation Prize. And it is a highly produced narrative podcast about the history of American consuls. 
I'm also the executive producer on a show about the history of the Appalachian Trail that just started a couple of weeks ago called The Green Tunnel. It's great. You should listen to it. But I also, not in my capacity as head of studio, but just in my spare time, I am the host of an interview show about naval history called Preble Hall, which comes out of the U.S. Naval Academy Museum. So I do a lot of different stuff, um, So, but I want to talk about Constellation Prize just for a second. Um, Constellation Prize is highly produced in that it sounds, um, it's a story, it's a narrative about different console every time or a couple of different consoles for each episode. Um, but we talk to experts and we do primary source reading, but it's not an interview show. It's really, it's a story and the experts just help us to tell the story. Um, we have music that's written for each episode, original music, and we use sound effects and all that stuff. So it's like, it sounds very, it sounds very highly produced. Like it sounds like there's a lot of work that goes into it, which is definitely true. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, but we have a full season under our belt now and we're just gearing up for season two. Uh, but this is the kind of show that um, it takes a lot of work, but I think the payoff is really great because it it's telling a story that most people don't really even think about. Like probably you haven't thought about consoles that much in your life unless you've traveled internationally, in which case maybe you've thought more about consoles, but 19th century consoles are really different. Uh, so that's my show. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, what I want to do now is I'm going to reopen the floor back to, uh, no, it was definitely intentional, by the way, the, the pun on Constellation Prize. <laughs> um, definitely. There's a reason I could talk about the name, why it's called that later. But now what I want to do now is open it up for our panelists to talk a little bit more about why you chose the form that you chose. And we're not gonna go in any particular order, so just chime in. Um, but why did you, I, I really am impressed by the variety of different forms we have represented across the panel, that's really great. So why did you choose the form that you did and what makes you think that was the right choice? Or maybe you think it wasn't the right choice, <laughs> I don't know. So just jump in. Go ahead, Hannah. <laughs> yeah, no, I saw Jared going, so I thought. Um, yeah, no, so I think the one thing that we wanted to do, or one thing that we really appreciated about podcast is sort of this unedited conversation that could last for however long you think the conversation is interesting. Um, so we kind of felt like we, we personally very much enjoyed having these conversations. So that's why we wanted to have a conversational format. Um, though maybe we also experiment a little bit with some kind of more debate-like um, episodes. So our first two are kind of like a debate, um, which also kind of worked, but also was more difficult. And we kind of wanted to, instead of, so one of the debates we had was like uh, about the academic canon and whether we were reading too much that white men, uh, which was an interesting question to begin with, but we often found that the panelists ended up agreeing anyway, kind of, which was also nice, um, but we also felt like we maybe wanted, we wanted to go more in depth and talk about the, the actual research and why we thought it was so important. So we just wanted to have these conversations. So that's why we ended up having this sort of conversational format. Go ahead, Jared. Um, so there were a few things that led to the decision to produce the show the way the way we do it. Uh, and the first is just this simple thought, what could we do that's a little different from what's out there already? Um, so there are just, so I mean, and we represent this diversity right here. There's so many wonderful shows that are um, conversation based or have a centralized host telling a story or I mean, there are many ways to, to approach how we communicate, um, how we use this uh, fantastic auditory medium. But it seemed as though there weren't that many that just let um, one voice kind of flow into another. Um, I, would, I would say, just a kind of sideline, that's probably a reason why um, our audience grows very slowly. We're still really very small, although I think for what we do, uh, I'm, I'm happy that we're, we're approaching 10,000 <laughs> downloads, but um, you know, these are not Joe Rogan numbers, but probably for the reason that we don't have a host that somebody connects to in that way. So it's, the, the show is aiming to create an experience. I guess that's the best way I could put it. And um, my influences in thinking about it this way, uh, on the one hand, 
were actually Lewis Lapham's um, journal, right? The idea of taking a theme and just putting together readings across time and across cultural spaces really appealed to me. Um, and on the other side of it, I'm, I'm very influenced by Mark Fisher's use of Derrida's concept of hauntology. And I kind of wanted the show to sound like this. Um, one of my collaborators, Amra Brooks, suggested what if we didn't actually have bumpers that introduced segments but just flowed? And I like that idea. Um, so that the aim was really almost if you could imagine uh, a satellite passing over the Earth, but also across time. And you're just kind of dialing in and out of these moments. But they all have to do with one another in some way. So um, I sat in on the, uh, the panel about editing just before this, and it struck me that uh, that's really what our approach has to be, is to try to edit through juxtaposition so that that's an interesting kind of journey, um, that we move through things in ways that are surprising or create uh, melancholy. I happen to like melancholy, not everyone does, but I love that feeling. That's where the Mark Fisher comes in, right? That sense of, uh, futures that never quite took shape, but we can still hear their residue. There's something, I think, lovely about that. But also humor. So we use a lot of archival sound, cheesy ads from the 50s. Uh, like for our photography episodes, we did a lot of camera ads that did relate to the readings, but also gave a kind of almost ironic tongue-in-cheek spin on that and then led us into the next thing. So I think those, um, I don't want to go on too long about that, and I'm happy to answer questions, but those are uh, the decisions for why we have a kind of hostless show and what we hope uh, a listener experience might be as a result of that. I'll just say I definitely got the melancholy vibe from what you played and it was lovely. It was great. Go ahead, Amanda. Okay, I, I just kind of catched what you said about time just there, Jared, because um, in in my case, or in our case at last reading, it was more like we were a bit pressed for time because producing a podcast in spring 2021, we were like we wanted to to make it as um, as close to the events as possible. And it was a bit it's a bit it's a bit um, it's a bit uncanny, but for us, as long as the lockdown was there, as long, then we we still had material for our research, right? And we also had a podcast who could be interesting to a lot of people. So, but that time was in, it would be inherently running out. So we didn't really know. So 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 I was really pressed for time, making very very fast and and very um, uh, maybe not very thought through uh, decisions about the podcast and I've never did a I never done a podcast before so it just became what it became and I think it actually got pretty okay if, if we take all of that uh if we have all of that in mind but any anyway I think uh, the shortness of a podcast can be a very good thing and I think the shortness of the podcast that I make is uh, is kind of um what makes it uh, both interesting and, uh, in lack of better words, bearable. <laughs> so, uh, so, so sometimes being pressed for time in that way, in that a bit more pragmatic way than what you're talking about, can also be a, a very um, yeah, important factor, I, I think. Anyone else want to weigh in? On... Go ahead, Robin. Well, I was going to say just just in terms of pragmatics, I, I really agree with that. It's it's nice to have a plan and know that you are. Um, what's the way to put it? Uh, just just know that that you can schedule uh, when you're going to do your work and when everyone else is going to be participating. So, the fact that we we sit down and we record for maybe half an hour, and then I I have a good sense of of pretty much how long it's going to take me to edit that that half hour down to like 21 minutes or something like that to make it fit. Um, so that's really lovely too. Um, and so that the chat is very comfortable and convenient for the people who need to participate. Because uh, I'm interested in, in oralization and in, in adding something extra to that, I'll often take those chats and where, where I see fit, I will put in extra sound after the fact. So it's a chat, but it's oralized. And I've just got a short, like one minute example here um, where Sasha Kerbler is talking about some music. And I was like, okay, that's great. I can put that music in behind while she's speaking and make it appear to fit. 
Um, so we were talking a little bit off air beforehand about how there's a, a moment in Mendelssohn's overture that's very difficult to get right for the orchestra. Can you talk a little bit about why that's difficult? Like what is it about that? Well, there's the uh, opening of the overture um, where we have four chords, four chords which are easy for the conductor to cue and, you know, there are no issues there. But then the fairies come in. So she breaks that down a little bit further afterwards. Um, but uh, that's a really, it, it's fun to have those opportunities to try and suggest a, another location, to try and suggest another mood by adding to that existing chat. So it's a chat, but it's an oralized chat. I love that. That's great. I'm going to go listen to that whole episode. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Any other thoughts on why you chose the form that you did? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we uh, kind of, uh, uh, Hannah, I think, talked about this as well, is um, I think we chose the form to preserve sort of the conversational nature of Alan and Mai's interaction. Um, the podcast was really born out of a member of our communications department walking by our offices, which are right next to each other and hearing us talk to each other for 45 minutes about comics with just out interruption. And, and he kind of popped his head in and said, you guys should really just do this as a podcast. Um, and then it actually started as a, a radio show on campus. And so we've we've preserved sort of the conversational nature of it for its origins. And, and also I think for us, um, you know, it, it makes it more manageable in terms of the work to prepare um, the show that you know ours is we we each do our own sort of preparation for it in advance but it's not a, a heavily researched show or anything like that so um i think some of the format is is sort of to preserve what this came out of so there's a great question in the chat which i'm gonna insert here instead of following our scripted questions that i sent you um it is how do audiences fit into each of your conceptions of podcast form how conscious do you want them to be of the form or how unconscious? What do you not want them to notice? And have you gotten listener feedback about the choices that you've made? I'll jump in there uh, to say that as a small podcast, I actually have no idea who our audience is. Um, and, and we'd certainly love more. We have yet to get any direct feedback that's outside of our community or outside that of those who contribute to the show. So I don't really know what the experience is, but given that the entire podcast is about trying to create um, a series of sensations and ways of moving through an idea, I would say that's the way in which we are aware of audience. We, we, we sort of imagine uh, somebody who wishes to do this somewhat unusual journey. It's not very long. It's about most are top off at 45 minutes and maybe it's being done while there's a workout or laundry is happening or it's on the commute. So we're certainly aware that, you know, someone's probably doing this along with something else and probably their attention is coming in and out. Um, so there's a sense, I think maybe just of how would one listen to such a thing, but we have yet to have a sense of who is our audience and what would they like, because there has yet to establish a feedback loop. I think we're too early uh, in this and, and perhaps um, haven't elaborated our uh, kind of feedback loop enough to hear from people. So we just sort of put it out there and hope that uh, somebody has a really unusual, maybe um, productively jarring or beautiful or thoughtful experience. And I think that's what um, leads to our decisions about what gets read and what's the sequencing. Um, as I say, we do, we do hope that it'll produce moments of laughter or just, you know, a little bit of irony that makes the thinking happen in a, in a different way, gives it some torque. Uh, and also just the idea of shaping an oral experience. I, Robin, I love your, uh, your term to oralize something. That's, I, I'd like to think that the ideas that are happening in the literary segments are also following through in uh, sometimes the, the sound bed. So sometimes we'll actually do sort of subtle sound effects or I'll compose some music, there's interstitial music. So all of those things, I guess the, the sum of my comment is we're hoping that somebody has um, an almost dreamlike experience as they move through it. And we hope that our ideal listener is a person who's, who, who's yearning for that. 
So I'll, I'll actually jump in here to talk not about Consolation Prize, but about the Green Tunnel. Um, it's a history of the Appalachian Trail podcast. And so we know very clearly who our audience is. It's people who hike on the Appalachian Trail and there's lots of them and they're not shy about giving feedback. So uh, we have actually already received feedback based on our one episode that's out in the world. Uh, but we, we were very deliberate in the choices that we made about how to structure the podcast to, to speak to the audience that we knew we were trying to capture because we knew we wanted hikers. We wanted something that they could listen to while they were hiking or while they were driving to their hike or you know places where they were already interested in the subject matter and we wanted to give them value added. So um, there are many podcasts out there about the AT. There are none that are like ours because almost all of those are just people talking at you all the time and sometimes talking nonsense at you all the time. And so we wanted to use an immersive narrative storytelling format with experts in the field, with sound effects, with news clippings, with you know all the different ways in which a historian would tell a story like this, because our, I'm a historian, the host of the show and the producer of the show is a historian. Um, you know, using all those things that we do to do good research, we wanted our audience to hear all of those things. And we wanted them to come away with a sense of true historical understanding and not just like, oh, that was interesting, but like that was interesting. And now as I'm walking on this trail, it means something different for me. Um, so that's, I mean, that's a challenge because there are lots of it's it's easy to lose a, a community that's not necessarily historically inclined. So we're we're definitely still feeling that out. But people have liked it so far. I'll say that people have specifically commented on how they like our show better than all the other shows that are just people talking at you. So take that for what it's worth. But other thoughts on audience? I think one thing that we really tried to do is our audience was supposed to be somewhat educated and academic as, as they needed to be interested in sort of humanities research. But I think what we really tried to do is kind of break down some of the boundaries between academia and the real world, but also between professors and students. So one of the one of the first questions or the one question that we opened up or that we opened with was, uh, kind of how did you get here? And then, yeah, you have this sort of more personal questions or like these more personal stories of uh, these academics and like how they came in to do, to do their research. And then we really tried to talk about the research, but also in like how it was relevant to society. So we really wanted to make listeners feel like they were in the room, like as if they were part of this conversation. So in that sense, maybe also relating to what Patrick was saying, but just giving this idea of, Sort of listening into a conversation that you could have been a part of and also making academia and especially humanities research more relatable and trying to I, maybe there's like a, an ambition of many sort of yeah i guess people who are into podcasting anyway trying to make our research more accessible for a, a sort of a, a general public but trying to break academia out of its its sort of ivory tower and um kind of show the world what like what the importance is of our project but just through sitting in this idea of sort of sitting in, in this conversation so in that sense very natural but very much geared towards this idea of um trying to have an understandable and relatable huh? yeah kind of uh to, to piggyback off of what hannah said again um you know i think in our show we sort of come, I think we, we come to what we talk about very much as fans of whatever we're talking about first, um, and then sort of, of move into more sort of uh, scholarly conversation or more of an academic conversation. So it's kind of a blend of a fanish academic sort of, of conversation that we have on the show, um, probably more so towards the fanish than the scholarly most shows. Um, you know, we do tend to laugh at ourselves and each other quite a bit and, and make horrible puns and things like that. So we, we try to keep it sort of, of lighthearted and fun. And, and as Hannah said, sort of trying to reach a 
broader audience um, or a more general audience um, with the kinds of things that we do. So there's a question in the chat, which I'm going to combine with a couple of the other questions that were on my list, because I want to talk about, I want you all to talk about how much time it takes you to make your show and what kind of resources you have to make your show and how your particular environment allows you to be more flexible or requires you to be less flexible in how you create the show that you do. So thinking about who and how long it takes you to make your show and how does your institutional affiliation affect that? I guess I, I can go first and, and just briefly, but uh, I, I have to say how incredibly fortunate I feel to be able to play in the way that I do with with my colleagues and the, the, the collaboration and just that we sit down and chat and then I get to go and mess around with the with the goal of surprising uh, the conversationalists afterwards with this with this thing that's got this extra layer added to it that they can appreciate and then hopefully get excited about it and share with their classes and as a way of introducing themselves to other people. Um, but uh, so, you know, my, my department has web space, so it's easy for me to just drop everything online and, and publish in a very conventional website format. Um, you know, I, I have tapped into Anchor mostly just as a means to get it further and to have a little bit of analytics and things like that. But um, but mostly we share it in a more sort of grassroots uh, way as opposed to being concerned that people are going to discover the podcast on, on one of those services. Um, and because I'm doing it for a couple of years now, even though it's only once a month, I have a good sense of the amount of time that it takes for me and the amount of time that it takes for other people. Um, and so then I get to think, of, you know, making the making the website and, and getting the art done for the website and things like that becomes a really fun collaborative process with other people as well. So um, I, I'm really fortunate that I don't have to worry about that commercial aspect of it. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking that some of the rest of us are in kind of that same space, but uh, I'm, I'm really astounded by the people who are able to say, let's approach, approach podcasting as a business first uh, and then be able to achieve that. I'm wowed by that. Other thoughts on this? Go ahead, Drew. Uh, yeah, well, we are definitely on that other end of the spectrum of business. Uh, there is... Uh, we are very lucky to have uh, specific forms of institutional support. Um, in the past couple of years, Stonehill College has built, um, under the guidance of particular Professor Scott Cohen, uh, the Digital Innovation Lab, and that houses a podcasting studio. So um, that's actually not something I specifically use, but we do have students who use it. So we've begun to use podcasting as um, as an instructional tool, as part of our pedagogy, as part of our, uh, for some of us, and, and this is, I, I guess, also connects to the idea of audience. Sometimes I think about, wouldn't it be great if someone were teaching this theme of, um, for instance, identity, it's the one that I'm working on now, well, this might be a really great thing to put in for students to listen to and, and respond to, so I definitely do think about that. We are kind of allowed to do whatever we like. There is no sponsorship that comes into it, so we don't have any particular uh, vested interest to pay attention to. Um, I'm not sure how many administrators are aware of or listen to our podcast, but that's kind of a nice thing too. We, we are on our own to shape it. Um, that said, it takes me, I'm the principal editor, and it takes me forever to do this, um, which is why we don't produce, it's, it's pretty erratic as a schedule. I'd love it for it to become a little more regular, but it just takes me a long time. I fuss about the sequencing and little fractions of sound. It, it gets to be very, um, uh, it gets to be a very sort of burdensome process at times, just trying to get it perfectly. Um, and then sometimes, um, particularly uh, Scott Cohen will pry it from my hands and say, hey, we, we have somebody who's trained up in the lab and, and they can do the music. Why don't you let them do the music? And so sometimes I'll, uh, I'll do that. So we are lucky also to have some student, um, uh, student fellows in the lab who can help with some of that production. So in some ways, it's a real mix. Uh, Robin, it sounds a little bit like your situation. It's a real mix of uh, there are some institutional resources, but there isn't much of a structure. We are the structure and we do what we can with it. Um, and I think the, the word, Robin, that you use is one I would use too. Uh, we get to play um, and also to collaborate. And that's a really beautiful, unusual way to interact with one another um, in an academic situation. 
I have a comment if nobody else is going for it. Go ahead. Okay, okay cool. Um, so just for the sake of being transparent, my uh, the, the podcast that I made was make, made uh, with money from the Carlsberg Foundation. You might know the beer. They have a lot of money, those guys. Um, and uh, they um, often actually um, use uh, fund, uh, give funding to projects in, in the humanities uh, in Denmark. And uh, this project, uh, Lockdown Reading, was funded by, funded by them. And in the funding package, there was money for this um, conference that we couldn't make and that money got transferred into making the podcast so when we did the, the the whole podcast they also had some ideas about how fast we should make it for it to still be for it to be relevant to their listeners because it would also be uh, published on their podcast channel so that was that that was kind of a it made a, it, it gave some bonds not not many and it wasn't because I wasn't free in doing what I wanted to do but but still in the time aspect uh, surely it did and and then I just wanted to say that it sounds like you have um, moved a bit faster uh, in the states and that's maybe no surprise <laughs> but um, but in Denmark it, like these podcasts are not something researchers do normally. Uh, we did one because we had money from external funding, um, but the communications department, not the people uh, researching communication, but the people doing communications at the University of Copenhagen would like to actually have it on their hands because they have University of Copenhagen as a brand and they don't really want anyone to compete with that. So I've been, well, we didn't know that, we just did what we did, you know, so <laughs> it's just out there. But we, I think it's, it can be a problem, that kind of branding strategy from a university or from an institution, which also meant that, that I didn't really get any help at all. Um, um, but it was okay, um, I think, and very form formative also for me, not only for the podcast. And uh, one more thing, I was thinking just about, just about form and how people with different backgrounds bring different form to a podcast. So for me as a literary critic, for me to, to write the podcast, I well, make the podcast, shape it, I, I, I wrote a manuscript. And I, I think a lot, maybe everybody would do that, but maybe not in the way a literary critic would do it. Maybe a historian would do it in a bit of a different way. And maybe a person from media studies would do it some third way. I don't know. Um, but I think that's pretty interesting that we bring our own identities or ideas of form into the, the form itself. Go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, uh, so our the, the podcast that I created was uh, next to our research masters with a friend of mine, and it was completely independent uh, when we did it. Uh, we had no funding, no help whatsoever, and it was always something that we had to do next to our everyday thing. So it has been very hard to keep it going, and we haven't really been able to, uh, especially because last year I had to teach a lot, and I had to uh, try and get funding for a PhD project. So it has been like it has been hard to yeah we really wanted to keep it going but it was very difficult and now that I finally got the funding for my PhD I know that I'm going to be safe for the next four years so now I finally feel like I have the time to sort of take it up again but yeah we had no not really institutional support and we even we had to think about it really carefully because um, we at some point our university wanted to help us out but or like wanted to give us support or uh, even uh, publish it for us, but that would mean that we could not talk about controversial topics anymore. So one of our podcasts was about free speech versus hate speech uh, on our campus uh, at, an, at an event that the university organized. And so they said, if you want to make content like that, we're not sure if we can, you know, support that as a university. So those are some, some difficult decisions. I think for now we decided to keep it independent um, and we're hoping to get started again soon. Um, but yeah, it was it was not very easy to get it started. And it took us a lot of time because especially when we, our aim was to sort of tease out 
like what was to us the most important thing about the research. So we had to know the research. So I would usually like read the book or, or a couple articles of the one of like the people coming in to talk about the research. So it was actually quite a lot of work um, to prepare for it. And so, it, yeah, it has, it's difficult to balance it with like actual things that you have to do for work and things that you really love and care about, which is podcasting. But luckily now that I'm doing a PhD on podcasting, I feel like I, I can spend some time making podcasts as well, but it wasn't very easy. I just, I, we've got two minutes left, so I'm just going to close this out here. But I will say, I think my situation is pretty much the opposite of all of the rest of you. Um, Constellation Prize was started through the Center for History and New Media, but it was an independent podcast as in there was no funding. I was making it on top of my regular responsibilities. Um, but just recently, uh, the reason I'm the head of R2 Studios is that we got a big grant from the Mellon Foundation, which is fantastic, but that does actually put some more strictures on us. So we have to care more about how many people are listening, who's listening, how we make the show. And we were always gonna make highly produced shows because that's just like what I want to do. And I think that's the right thing for our content. Uh, but it, it has meant that I've had to think a lot more about the sort of businessy aspects. Like we do care about analytics now because we have to report back to the Mellon Foundation that they gave us all this money and we've done something with it that is, you know, seems like we've done some good, you know, right? Uh, so I think it's, we, I, I work, as I said, I work on Preble Hall, which is completely independent. And that's like, you know, whatever listeners are nice, but we're just talking about naval history. It's all fine. Uh, but for, for Constellation Prize and for the Green Tunnel and our, our future shows, it's going to be um, a lot more on the sort of businessy, like thinking about audience, doing advertising, like all of that stuff. So like more like an NPR shop and less like a sort of academic institution, which has been a real problem for our academic institution to grapple with, actually. So I can talk more about that to anybody who wants to hear about it later. Um, but I think that is all the time we have. So I want to thank all of the panelists for contributing. This has been a fantastic conversation. And if you have more questions, you can feel free to reach out to me or and I can pass on information. I'm going to put my email in the chat so you can email me if you want and have a great rest of your day.